around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here today. We'd like to welcome each of you to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. As always, it is our prayer that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is touching your heart and life, pouring the oil and the wine into your heart and into your spirit. Amen. I do want to make mention of our revival meeting in America here in Hickory, North Carolina at the Hickory Metro Convention Center. Hickory Metro Convention Center the meeting is free of charge. There are plenty of motels and hotels around the convention center. Many and plenty restaurants. Everything is right close by. You can walk from the convention center to several different restaurants like Chick-fil-A, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a great, great place and a great venue those dates are September the 20th, the 21st, and the 22nd. What I need for you to do for me is write us, phone us, or email us and tell us how many is coming in your party. That way we can tell the convention center people how many chairs, how many seats we need for them to put out to help us have a great, great meeting. If you would do that for us, it would be so easy to call at 704-538-8060 and say, hey, there's three, there's four, there's five coming in our party, and that will help us. Or go to our website, www.thevoiceofevangelism.com. Go to contact us and tell us there how many is coming in your party. Or just drop us a little letter, a note in the mail, at Post Office Box 502, Kaser, C-A-S-A-R, North Carolina, 28020. If you'll do that, I'll be very, very grateful and thankful and appreciative for your helping us to do this. I'm looking for the Holy Ghost to begin to move in a deeper and richer way in the coming days. The Lord must help us to counter the evil that is fomenting in the earth. God is going to have to strengthen us and help us. In Psalms 22, verse 11, trouble is near me for there is none to help. No man is going to be able to help us in the capacity and the manner that we need. It will take divine intervention from God. It's going to take God's power. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It's going to take the presence of God in your life to sustain you and undergird you for the coming days. This is why David said what he said there and petitioning the Lord there in Psalms 22, 11, be not far from me for trouble is near for there is none to help. I pray for you. I pray for the letters, the emails that come across my desk, the phone calls where people want us to pray about their needs, their prayer requests. But we all are going to have to come together in prayer 
the more people that are praying, the more people that are interceding, the more greatly God will move in our behalf. Abraham petitioned Elohim in behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, sadly, they were all lost initially except for Lot, his wife, and two daughters. Even his sons-in-law mocked him and ridiculed him and castigated him. And so the angels took Lot, his wife, and two daughters out of the city physically by the hand. And, of course, we all know that God gave the one commandment, don't look back. But in Genesis 19, 26, and she, Lot's wife, looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. That's what disobedience does. There's no doubt in my mind she went to hell. How do you know? I believe that because of what Jesus said in Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife. Had she went to heaven, I don't believe he would have made that statement. We don't even know her name. Isn't it ironic? We don't know her name. We don't know her name. Jesus didn't identify her other than Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Probably the second shortest verse in the Bible. The shortest verse is Jesus wept. Remember Lot's wife. Why remember her? Why remember her? <clears throat> because of her significance and how it, 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 it should warn us that God means what he says. God said, don't you look back. But she did. And thus Christ warned us, remember her. Remember her. We need to remember some things. Jesus spoke to us, the believer, those around him, and said, remember Lot's wife. So if you don't know who she was, et cetera, you go back and you study, you find out why we are admonished to remember her. What's the purpose if, of remembering her? I'll tell you what it was, because she ended up being lost. She was lost without God. Because her heart, her feelings, her emotion, her spirit was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, she was out of the city in her flesh. But her spirit and her heart and her mind was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That tells me her treasure was in Sodom, thus her heart was in Sodom. We should never toy, play with God, and treat God in a trivial manner. He's worthy of the utmost respect, to say the least. I want to go back today to Psalms 37, verse 34. Wait on the Lord, keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Repeatedly here in this 37th Psalms, David admonishes each and every one of us that we're going to inherit the earth. 
He repeats that phrase, that mindset, six times in this 37th chapter. He wants to burn it within our hearts that the earth is our inheritance and the believers, the redeemed, the blood bought, will rule and reign with Christ 1,000 years here on planet earth. But David goes a little bit further, giving us revelation and giving us insight as to what's going to happen to the wicked and that you and I will see it. In other words, we will witness what God does to the wicked. Notice the last phrase here in Psalms 37, 34. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. You and I, if we remain steadfast, we hold to his nail-scarred hand. We do not turn back to this world, but we keep our hands on the old gospel plow. We will see the reward of the wicked. We will witness as they are cut off from the earth. This is why the parable of the wheat and the tares is so powerful and why it is so significant. Throughout the scriptures, things are either black and white, good or evil, sweet and bitter, wheat and tares. God makes it clear either a sheep or a goat. There, there's no in-between. It is men that create that element of being in-between, not being light, not being dark, being gray. This is, this is the revelation to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3, 15, 16, Jesus said, I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art work cold or hot, so that because thou art lukewarm, tepid, indifferent, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You see, the church at Laodicea was a church that was neither hot, neither cold. It was lukewarm. It was tepid. It was indifferent. I saw a few clips weeks ago. You probably saw more of it than I did. I don't know. You may have seen less than I did. But the district attorney, Miss Fanny Willis in Atlanta, Georgia, I saw two clips. One, she talked about drinking gray goose. For those of you who don't know, that's a liquor. It's a type of vodka, if I remember correctly. She's having sex with a man she hired who does not have a divorce. So she's I don't know her status, but if she's not married, she's fornicating. He's committing adultery. They're drinking. They're cohabitating. They're shacking up. But she said something that struck me, which shows me the state of the church, the state of professing Christians, and the spiritual mindset that these people have relative to the the powerful act of deceit in their minds. She said, people are, many people are sending me emails, text, and they're giving me Isaiah 54, 17, which says, 
No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Meaning you're a child of God. Now I know some listening don't like me to say things like that. But I'm going to tell you, if John the Baptist was standing in that courtroom, he would size her up and tell her the truth about her life and her lifestyle. I'm disturbed by the cowardice, the cowardice of men that call themselves men of God. I'm concerned about the weakness, the ineptness, the fragility of these men that call themselves men of God. I would say to Miss Willis, you're not right with God. You admit you're a liquor drinker. You're, you admit you shack up and you go big and you do this and you do that, and yet you believe that God is somehow honoring you, God is regarding you, God is esteeming you, God is exalting you and telling you no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. <laughs> this is the cynicism that has pervaded and permeated the church. This is the problem. Somebody needs to tell her the truth. Don't butter her up with Bible verses because God is not going to guard and protect people who live a life of sin. They're not in relationship. They're not in covenant with God. I'm working on a sermon. I may preach it in the conference, the revival meeting. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. David is about to die. He says to Solomon, I go the way of all the earth. He's saying I'm going to die. He made that statement. Joshua made that statement. Both men said, I go the way of all the earth, meaning cattle, rabbits, deer, uh, beavers, skunks, possums. Everything goes, all the, goes the way of the earth, meaning we all die if the Lord tarries. But he said next to that, he says to Solomon, Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Now, if you study the life of the psalmist David, he was a man's man. This guy was not soft. He was not effeminate. He was not weak. He was still fighting physically into his 60s. And he almost got killed. And a soldier stepped in and took out the combatant that David was fighting, and they said, you'll not go out into battle anymore, lest the light of Israel go out. Your life will be extinguished. But this guy was physically fighting in his 60s. He died at 70. He had a relatively short life. But he was a man's man. Saul's trying his best to kill him. He told David, he said, you, you get a hundred foreskin of the Philistine soldiers, I'll give you my daughter. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. David came back with 200 foreskin. Now, I'm going to tell you, you got to kill men to get their foreskins when they're 30, 40 years of age. He doubled 
what Saul asked of him. And the Bible says Saul knew that God was with David. He knew what he had asked, hoping if you try to go kill a hundred men to get me a hundred foreskin, those men will kill you. See, God doubled up on it. He allowed him to take out 200 men's lives. So when David says to Solomon in 1 Kings 2 and 2, and show thyself a man, he wasn't talking about some limp-wristed, some effeminate, transgender creature. He said, be a man. It's time for men to become women, men to become men, and women to become women. It, it, this, this straddling the fence is pathetic. Be all you can be for the Lord Jesus Christ. Getting back here to Psalms 37, 4, wait on the Lord. Keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. If you're righteous and alive at the second coming of Christ or you are resurrected in the first resurrection at the second advent of Christ, you will stand in this earth and you will witness as God deals with the wicked. For the psalmist declared, when the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. You're going to witness. You're going to watch this. You're going to observe as he takes out the wicked. Psalms 91 and verse 8. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked or the reward of the lawless. The word of God teaches us we're going to see this. Now, I do not believe there will be joy. I do not believe you'd be elated. I believe you will stand there in awe and reverence as Jesus Christ meets out judgment in the earth. Remember, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 says, He comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, people want to, beat me up and say, you're too hard. You're too harsh. Jesus saved a man on the cross. Well, yes, he did. He certainly did that. He let them smite him. He let them bruise and batter and, 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 and darken, blacken his face by the profuse beating, the bruises, the wounds, the contusions, the swelling of his face, the swelling of his lips, they turned wrong side out. His eyes swole nearly shut. But we need to understand, when Jesus returns the second time, he's not going to come back and let them do that to him. He's going to do to them what they did to him. He's going to beat the mess out of them. Now you say, well, that's just hard. That's just cruel. See, people don't know their Bible. Look up the word vengeance. Vengeance. He comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be a time of vengeance. Don't fool yourself. Don't deceive yourselves. It's going to be a time of profuse judgment in the earth. The righteous, the redeemed, the godly will witness everything that Christ does. As I shared with you the other day, I believe it was, Romans 12 and 19, Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. 
I know it's hard sometimes to not want to avenge ourselves. Let God avenge and vengeance. Listen. I, 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 I see him having a temper and venting righteous indignation against all of this wickedness. He's going to rule with the rod of iron. Think about that. That is a very intimidating posture to stand, innumerable crowns on his head, eyes like flames of fire, and in his hand he's going to wield a rod of iron and he's going to tread the fierceness, the winepress, the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Jesus is going to do that. You ever seen a police officer with a a night stick in his hand, a baton, and he's holding it and he's hitting his he's hitting his other hand. I've seen those batons. I was in jail one night. And the jailer said, You take off your boots before you go in there. I said, I'm not taking off my boots. He said, Take off your ring, take off your belt, and take off your boots. I said, I, I gave him my, my class ring, I gave him my belt. I said, but I'm not going in that jail barefooted. He said, you take off them boots, and I mean right now. Big old bull. There's a, there's a counter between me and him. I said, I'm not taking off my boots. I noticed he reached under the counter, and he got something. He walked to the end of the counter, and he came around to the side I was on, and I looked. And he had a billy club about two and a half feet long. And he said, I said, take off those boots. And I said, where do you want them? Because I knew he was getting ready to lay in on me. See, I have a, I have a visualization of Christ, how he's going to rule with a rod of iron and, and, and they're going to be people in the earth like me going to jail that's stupid. Yeah, they're going to be people that's stupid during that time. And he knows they're going to act stupid because they're sinners. They oppose God. But they won't oppose him then. His his. His presence is going to be so powerful, so dynamic. Men will melt. They'll wilt like polyester material in a, a flame of fire. It'll just, it'll just wither. Now, I know some of you, I, I, I don't believe it'll be that harsh. I don't believe it'll be that hard. Oh, it's going to be hard. He will rule with the rod of iron. He will slay them with the breath of his lips, Isaiah said. That word slay there means to kill. Look it up. I'm not making this stuff up. Listen, they've damaged creation. They've persecuted. They've martyred Christians. Persecution is coming to you and I. Get ready for it. I've not said this publicly, but if Donald Trump goes back into the office of presidency, you haven't seen the likeness of chaos you're going to see. There will be such division. There are those that will burn everything down just to keep him from being victorious in any capacity, any measure. He said a few weeks ago, as Laura Ingram interviewed him, my retribution will be success. Don't believe everything you hear. The man's had a four-year education. When he comes in, if he gets in,
there will be retribution, there will be vengeance. These people are so evil, they will they will seek to burn this nation down to the ground. Listen, listen to me very closely, please. You know there is something terribly wrong. You know there is something profusely evil. You know there is something out there that is a presage, a a foreboding. Something is lurking, and it is evil to its core. Evil to its core. I didn't know till my kids began to try to text me the other week when the phones quit working. I didn't know it. I didn't I didn't recognize it. There are those who say it was chronal mass ejections from off of the sun that caused this anomaly. Then there are those who say it's a trial run by the Chinese, like the balloon that floated across America. I mean, you you have Chris Ray, the director of the FBI, that is telling us for every one man we have working in the FBI to thwart cyber crime and, and, and cyber infiltration into our networks and systems, they have 50. They have 50 trying to get in and corrupt and destroy through malware. And for every 50 they have, we have one trying to defend it. We know there is something foreboding something catastrophic, something unimaginable is just waiting. Listen, I had a couple call me from Dallas yesterday, troubled because they feel what we all feel. They know deep down inside there is something There is something that is waiting, waiting to be executed, and I promise you it will not be good or pretty. It will be bad, ugly, and evil. You must pray. I I know some of you probably get tired of hearing me say that. Well, I hate to tell you this, I am not tired of saying it. And I'm going to keep on saying it. I'm going to keep on repeating it. I'm going to keep on preaching it. I'm not going to let up because I know we are in the throes and devastation and chaos and trouble is on our doorsteps. We have got, we have got to get close to God. We have got to lay aside the weights and the sins that doth so easily beset us. We've got to put away idols, idolatry, sin. We must rid ourselves of of any element of sin, living a godly Christian life. I'm not talking perfection. I don't believe in utter perfection while we're incarcerated in this clay jar. I don't believe that. I don't preach that. We're all fallible. We're all corrupt. But we've got to walk with God to keep that evil that abides in our flesh and not allow it to come to fruition, not allow it to arise and destroy us. That's the sin nature. It's in us. It's in us.
You've got to keep it at bay. And through prayer and the Holy Scriptures, God will help us. Listen, God wants you to make it. God is for you. God is not against you. God is for you. Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? He wants you to succeed. He wants you to win. He wants you to overcome. And when you do fail, he recognizes your fragility and your weakness, your ineptness. He, he recognizes that he's not a hard taskmaster. He simply wants you to just try. Please try. Put your hand to the plow and try to never look back because if you look back, he said, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. At one time or another, we all have looked back. We looked over our shoulder. We reminisce. We reflect. That's why it's terrible to live a life of sin because if you've once lived a life of sin, you can reflect, you can rehearse, you can remember, you can go back and into that moment of time where you were committing such an ungodly deed and evil act. But if you live right, you have nothing to reflect on regarding those types of sin. They're not there. I often wonder, Every time something negative happened in the psalmist David's life, after he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he rehearsed that wicked, ungodly event that he committed and did. When Ahithophel gave Absalom poor, pathetic counsel to hurt David, I'm sure David rehearsed and reminisced that ungodly act. When Amnon raped Tamar, I'm sure he rehearsed the fact. When Absalom and his buddies got Amnon drunk and they slew him, David remembered and rehearsed the act. When Joab stabbed Absalom and killed him, I know David rehearsed the act of sin he committed. Why? Because he knew that was the origin, that was the root, that was the root of his problem. It came from that ungodly act of sin, committing adultery and followed up with murder. That's why Psalms 51 is so powerful. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. You see, when, when a man makes a statement of that gravity, he's thinking, he's rehearsing, he's remembering what he did. Because he realizes the gross, irreparable damage that was done when he committed that act of sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, sin soils and sullies and stains your spirit. It stains your spirit. Cast me not away. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. What, what, what makes a man say, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me? What makes a man say that? He realizes his iniquity. He's rehearsing the sin, the act that he committed, and he sees the devastation and the destruction that it is continuing to cause in his heart and his life. And he made a statement. I'll never forget the day I got the revelation. There in Psalms 51, verse 14, he said, Deliver me from blood guiltiness. And I thought about that, and I thought about that blood guiltiness. What, what was David's blood guiltiness? What blood was he guilty of shedding? Uriah. 
See, all of this is going through the mind of the psalmist, the the battle within, you might say, the, the profuse battle within the mind and the soul and the spirit of a man. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, thou God of my deliverance. Deliver me, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. David knew how grotesque his act of sin was. This is why you're better off to have never gotten into the depths and the dregs of sin. Some people sadly, regrettably, struggle to forgive themselves. Some people regrettably can't get over their past. Their past makes them like Mephibosheth, a lame, a cripple. And I suppose in some respect, every one of us are lame. Every one of us are cripples in some capacity. Sin will cripple you. Sin will put a mark on your life that can never be removed except by the blood of the Lamb, and then you still suffer the consequences of disobedience. The uh, Paul in Romans seven twenty four, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul understood in his clay jar was nothing but rot and ruin and decay and destruction, and he was honest. You see. This is the problem with a lot of people today. They trick themselves. They deceive themselves. They're not honest with themselves and admitting the truth of the matter. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This body is assigned to death. Why? Because Adam sinned. Adam sinned sinned, and because Adam sinned, we suffer. And sin, the rations, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6 and 23. God, though we have sinned, though we have transgressed, though we have come short, and by the way, you will come short of God's glory every day of your life. You in this present life will not be glorified until Jesus Christ returns. Once Christ returns, you will become glorified. Or in the resurrection, you will receive a glorified body you will receive it. Romans 7, verse 18, For I know that in me, that is my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. There is nothing good about the flesh. Nothing Nothing. Nothing will ever be good about the flesh because the flesh is corrupt. The flesh is soiled. The flesh is sullied. The flesh is stained. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the one 
to deliver us. Let me let me share one more passage here in Romans 7, 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. The law of my mind. And what is that law in my mind trying to do? It's trying to bring me back into captivity. It is trying to hold me hostage. It doesn't ever want me to be free. It wants me to ever live and dwell on my past faults, my past failures, my past shortcomings. You see, godly men and women acknowledge that. But remember Philippians 3, verses 13, 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That, that, that is a a peculiar verse. But if you look at it in the spirit, Paul could never forget the past and hailing and dragging Christians to prison, having them executed, etc., etc. David could never forget his adultery, his murder. But what are they saying? They're saying, I've got to put this behind me. God knows my heart when I say this. They had to compartmentalize that. They had to put it in a box. Keep it sealed. Keep it away. Keep it out of their lives and go on. Not as though nothing ever happened. They know that it happened. But they didn't let their past hold them hostage to their past sins. They were freed from it. Now, any man can seek to go live in the past, and sadly and regrettably, a lot of people live in the past. That's why they can't get into their future. They can't get into their blessings of God because they're too focused on the failure of the past. <laughs> Just like I shared a few moments ago about being in jail. I didn't forget that stuff when I got saved. It's just a reminder to me how stupid I was. <laughs> I mean, I was stupid. You can't fix stupid. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, I know we got the pious crowd out there, Mr. and Mrs. Goody Two Shoes, that act as though they've never done anything like that. Maybe you haven't. <laughs> But if you weren't washed in the blood of the Lamb, you were just as lost as I was. Just as removed from God as I was. But I, I know one thing. And Peter learned that. Paul learned that. David learned that. To whom much has been forgiven, they love much. They love much. I realize how much God has forgiven me. I realize the multitudinous of the sins that God has forgiven me. That's why I owe him everything. That's why I love him so immensely, so powerfully. That's why I'm devoted to him. I know what he has forgiven me of. I'm not worthy. I've told him. I don't know why you didn't cut me off. I don't know why you didn't let me die in my sins in a car wreck or, or whatever the case. You let me go out into eternity, but he loved me too much. The scripture came to my mind this morning in prayer. Jeremiah 31, 3, Therefore, with loving kindness have I loved thee. Excuse me. Therefore, with loving kindness have I loved thee. With loving kindness have I drawn thee. That word kindness in the Hebrew means mercy, grace, and love. That's what the word kindness there means. 
mercy, grace, and love. And God has loved us immeasurably in spite of who and what we are. Got the, the love of God is so great. Let me get this verse right. So, uh, Jeremiah 31, 3. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Two significant words there. Loved and everlasting love. Love and, A-N, love and everlasting love. It is, it, it is eternal, the love of God. Of course, that's talking to Israel because of his covenant with Abraham, but it is applicable to you and I because God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness, loving kindness, Kindness have I drawn thee, meaning my love is merciful. My love is gracious. There's nothing like the love of God. As I've said to you many times, our love is flawed. Even our love toward God is flawed. But God's love toward us is perfect. God's love toward you is absolutely perfect. There, there is no shortfall. There's no shortcoming. There is nothing lacking in the love of God toward you. But we can't say that because we are flawed. But because we recognize the love of God toward us, we reciprocate the best we can in returning love back to him. I'm telling you, you need to fall in love with Jesus again. I love him. I love him so much. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He means so much to me. He's everything to me. I am a flawed man. Things that I do are flawed. My love is flawed. My thoughts are flawed. My feelings are flawed. Everything about my humanity is flawed, but not his. His is perfect. He loves us with a perfected, everlasting love. And he has perfected, he is perfected in his loving kindness toward us. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, one of the most beautiful stories of Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son that was a cripple, was a lame. Saul is dead, Jonathan's dead, and all of Saul's other sons are dead. And David asked Ziba a question. Is there any left in the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God. That, 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 that is so powerful. I do not have words. I do not have the vocabulary. I am not able to convey the depth and the breadth of that. Is there any left in the house of Saul that I may show him the kindness of God. I want to show, if there's any relatives left, I want to show them the kindness of God. That's why David was a type of the Messiah. David did some questionable things, if I must say so. But the little shepherd boy, he loved the true shepherd. 
And when everyone in Saul's house was destroyed, one was assassinated, there was one left, Mephibosheth. And David said, is there any left, any left in the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? That's why people who are washed in the blood in general are kind. We're not perfect, but we're kind because God's love that is in the heart of the believer shines from within. It shines out to a lost world. And we show people the kindness of God. I am so glad God showed me love, grace, and mercy. And to whom has been forgiven much, loveth much. I I don't expect, I don't know that people can know unless they've been there, of the power of love and forgiveness. And God bless you. If you've been a, a, a believer, a Christian, that never got into the dregs of sin. You know, I, I tell my dear friend Jimmy Smith, you know, he just, he said he went to a pool hall one time. And his daddy nearly beat him to death. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't get into the dregs of sin. Met his wife, Peggy. He's either third or fifth grade. They got married. Been married over 50 years. Never got into drugs. Never got into alcohol. Never got into a promiscuous lifestyle. Never got into that. But he also knows the love of God because he was lost too. Whatever God has forgiven you for, thank him, be grateful, always acknowledge his goodness. In closing, please pray. Please pray. Seek the faith, seek the counsel of God. We're going to need his help in the coming days because there is something out there that is truly uncertain. God bless you. I'll see you next week in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.